PhD Palliative Project Echo. Uh, so glad you could all join us. My name is Chris Piramalli, and I'm going to be today's facilitator for Project Echo. Um, just a couple of notes. Uh, we'll be filming today's uh, uh, didactic session, and so and this is for educational purposes. So just make sure you meet, mute your phones and pagers and try to minimize disruptions. Uh, for everyone who's on, a CME and CEUs are offered. And so um, definitely look at your email or go to our website to find out how you can get those, uh, those uh, certificate hours. Um, today we are so pleased to have our very own Rana Johnson, um, who is our palliative care advanced nurse practitioner and has uh, just so much experience here at ANTC and with the Alaska Tribal Health System. But she's going to be sharing uh, today, she'll be presenting on addressing culture and serious illness uh, and injury. And so thank you so much for sharing with us today, Rana. And uh, just so everyone knows, if you have questions, we will have time at the end of uh, uh, the presentation to uh, have a little discussion. And so you can ask your questions there. I'm going to turn things over to Rana so she can dive right into the presentation. Sweet. So welcome everybody, super excited to see people here to talk about culture and serious illness. Um, as Chris was saying, I've been at ANTHC lucky enough since 2003, and as an Alaska Native myself, I, this has always been super, super interesting. So the objectives today, we're really going to talk about a couple of things, cultural competence versus cultural, cultural humility. Um, we can talk about how culture can be a barrier to care. And then one way to help raise awareness among ourselves. Next slide. So the one thing that I wanted to start off with is a lot of times we confuse um, culture and ethnicity and race. And so I thought it was, it was helpful um, just to kind of define what they are. So ethnicity, Think of it more of a broad scope. It's relating to large groups of people uh, classed according to the common racial, national, tribal, religious, linguistic, or cultural origin or background. So like when you're talking about Little Italy in New York City, that is the ethnic part of New York City. When we're talking about race, that's typically defined by color. Um, so that's describing a family tribe, people of the or nation belonging to the same stock. Um, I thought that was an interesting, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, definition from Merriam-Webster. Um, and then culture, which is what we're going to focus on today, is really the beliefs, uh, social forms, material traits of a racial, religious, or social group, the characteristic features of everyday existence shared by people in a place or a time. So when we think about that, it is a little bit more specific. It's the values, beliefs, and the underlying assumptions, the attitudes, and the behaviors that we carry. So it, when we think about culture, it's just huge. And so many times we see the word cultural competence being thrown around. Um, it's kind of, it's kind of um, hip and cool. And um, a lot of organizations will bring um, cultural competence training to, to their organization, and it's a word that we throw around um, pretty regularly. And I just kind of wanted to define what it is. So it's acquiring and integrating knowledge with the awareness, attitude, and skills about culture and cultural differences to ensure optimal and expert care to patients. We talk about this um, in our team at all. It's kind of all the time. It's actually kind of an offensive term in some ways because it's crap. We can't really um, be competent about culture ever. Um, to feel that we're competent of, about culture is hubris, and it's it's, it's very um, it's kind of a terrible place to come from because it throws up automatic barriers with these biases that you're pretty much per perpetuating within yourselves. So to get in this a little bit more to, to understand what I'm um, thinking about and talking about is when we think about the cultural iceberg, I thought this was a neat picture. There are so many things um, at the top of the iceberg that are easy to see. Like we can judge um, by language, we can let, judge by dress, we can, we can kind of start seeing a little bit of um, that outer aspect of culture and maybe how it pertains to a particular individual. But what we don't see is the 90% rest of the iceberg that can kind of get us in trouble if we're really judging the tips as this person. And when we're thinking about 
culture, as a person, and as, as a people, um, all of these things, including Wi-Fi, so um, physiological um, safety, belonging and love, self-esteem and self-actualization, those things are all really parts and pieces of what builds culture. Um, those, those, are, those experiences and those nuances are super important to be able to um, define a person um, and really kind of cultivate the way that they see themselves or participate in the world. So Father Michael Oleska, he's a, um, he's a Russian Orthodox priest here in our tribal system. He's actually a white person from the East Coast. But he married a Yupik um, woman, and he is one of the best culture keepers that I think we have. Um, he defines culture as your story. And I find that as a really profound um, definition of culture. Kind of what I take away from that is even, even when you're growing up in the same family, I take my brother, for example, it's like he's an alien. Um, but when you think about two people growing up in the same family with the same experiences, going to the same school, eating the same food, we are so completely different. And when you think about, again, those parts and pieces of that iceberg, one would assume that we share a lot of the same values or um, kind of the same background or even the same memories, which is absolutely not true. Um, it's not a bad thing. It just is. And so that's where we kind of need to... Um, recognize that culture is so much bigger than what we think it is. So why is this important? So it's really important, especially in healthcare, to be thinking about this. There's a background um, to uh, cultural barriers and biases that we carry in healthcare systems. It's kind of endemic, and there's some reasons for it. Um, there's people of other cultures that are really, really um, wary of healthcare systems, and we we practice in one of them at the Alaska Native Medical System and the Alaska Tribal Health System. And when we think about why, um, it, you know, back in the day, there was a lot of racial bias. There was a lot of um, Alaska Natives that were used um, against their will for um, research purposes. Um, they were moved to different places. They were, um, they, they just were taken from but not given back to. And a lot of that was driven by the healthcare system. Um, health behaviors uh, impact and can be barriers, um, environmental factors, even, you know, where they are, where they're coming from, the delivery of health care, some people have it, some people don't, some people, the language is an issue, um, sometimes it's the socioeconomic status, if, if they have to decide between fuel oil or a flight to the village to check out a cop that's been going on for a long time, they're likely going to pick the fuel, fuel oil. And that's typically what we see in oncology is we see later stage um, cancers diagnosed at stage three and stage, stage four because you've got these rural elders or these rural people who typically don't access the healthcare system until they can't do something. So if they're not able to subsist anymore, that's when they're starting to get worried um, or starting to be kind of pushed in the direction of, of going into the healthcare system. And the other thing is health literacy. It has nothing to do with, you know, the school education. It just has everything to do with understanding and um, self-actualization of the, of the importance of screenings um, and all the things that kind of help us stay healthy. Next slide. And another thing that I really want to bring up, um, just to point out, it's always been super, super fascinating to me. There's something called historical trauma. Um, many of you have probably already heard about it. Um, but it's really an issue and it's really a thing. Um, for Alaska Native people, it really, um, you know, it's based on the experiences of our elders or our generations before us that, that they had these reoccurring losses. They were stripped um, from literally their culture. Um, they were moved into or forced into a, kind of a rat hole where they needed to speak the English language, they needed to school in the English setting, um, they needed to practice the white religion. And what happens is there's kind of this reoccurring loss. They, they're losing their identity. A lot of times they're even taken away from their home place, um, even as children, away from their families. And then they go and they integrate into the white culture, but they don't fit in. Um, but they stay there maybe through their schooling and they'll come back and they don't fit in at home anymore. Um, so that kind of discrepancy and that dichotomy um, 
really starts to get people. Um, what we see is that it's compounded, these losses and these kind of these um, really weird feelings that kind of come out um, are compounded over generations. And it's, it's more, it's actually kind of more of a big deal right now because the people that it didn't happen to are often most affected. A lot of times they're, they're um, kind of participating in these behaviors or these actions or reactions that they have. Um, they don't know where they're coming from. Perhaps they have nothing to whine around about, but they just don't ever feel whole or they feel like they can't integrate. And those are all learned behaviors. So that past continues to affect the future. And in some cases, it's more impactful in the, in the newer generations who can't remember the atrocities that happened, but they're just kind of feeling them or still carrying them. Um, it leads to things that we see like self-medicating for pain that Nobody knows why it exists. You know, they're um, drinking, they're, they're drugging. Um, perhaps there's uh, more domestic violence, um, more completed suicides. All of those things play into kind of the root cause of historical trauma in most cases. Next slide. So when we think about this, when we think about how big and broad culture is, it starts to get a little bit tedious and a little bit overwhelming. And it's like eating elephant one spoonful at a time. What we can do is we can back up and just agree to be, um, to have some humility and understand that cultural humility is really a process that's more about us. How do we reflect and how do we criticize ourselves or critique ourselves to acknowledge the places of power that we have in the healthcare system, that we hold an amazing amount of kind of um, power over some people that are really, really vulnerable, that it involves more of involving that patient, um, bringing them to the forefront of medical decisions, encouraging them to have um, more um, say in what their care is doing, and focusing on the development of those mutual partnerships. Next slide. So, and again, I think this is a really important slide to kind of kind of um, bring up because. When you think about Western medical um, perspective, you start to understand why culture, the culture of Western medicine fights with a lot of times indigenous cultures. Um, so in Western medicine, death is a taboo subject. We just don't talk about it. Um, we really focus on more on the care than, or the cure than the care. Um, we tend to really, um, we're technology crazy. Um, we consider uh, that technology is going to repair those, those damaged parts and pieces. And when it doesn't work, it's kind of like a failure. Um, there's definitely a paternalistic model of care. It's more centered around diagnosis. We tend to refer to people as that guy in liver failure in room 406 rather than a name attached to it. It's more often driven by timelines. Um, patients are typically passive without knowledge of the healthcare system or even health literacy in general. Um, and that we look at health as the absence of disease, and that's really important, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, the mind and body are treated separately, they're considered completely different, and that document documentation is our communication. So I'm going to back up a little bit and kind of contrast this to um, kind of overview of the Alaska Native perspective and cultures. So when we think about death as a taboo subject, a lot of times in the Alaska Native cultures, it's just part of life. It's not that they're not thinking about it. It's just something that stuff happens. And they talk about giving their body back to the earth um, so that they can see the animals. And it's kind of this just big, beautiful circle. The, the paternalistic model of care is very, um, uh, familiar to them. They're, they do, they're comfortable most of the time assuming that role of, of somebody who is a little bit more passive. Often they don't understand that they have healthcare choices. Um, we all know that when you get sick and you get thrown into the medical wheel, often that starts spinning so quickly that you don't even know how to get off. Um, and a lot of times we, we see that for patients where they just kind of get stuck and they don't understand that they have the option to get off or they have the option to say no. 
Um, and again, when we talk about tra timelines, I mean, one of the biggest frustrations for um, many of the clinics and, and parts of the hospital here is people are never on time. And when we think about, you know, we have a one o'clock appointment and they don't use clocks out there in the village. Maybe they fish when the fish are in and they hunt when the, you know, hunt when the herd comes through and they pick berries when they're ripe and they go to bed when the sun goes down and, you know, it's more of a tangible piece of time, how they can tell that um, rather than a clock. And so when we confuse those things or we give big swaths of things to do and big pieces that are kind of complex, it's not a wonder that we struggle with kind of connecting and, and um, making that um, kind of move forward and be successful. Um, again, speaking about health as the absence of disease, it, it, when we're comparing the Alaska Native population which often looks at more of a holistic picture of the mind, body, spirit, and how interrelated they are. The health can encompass um, a body and a spirit, even in the presence of disease, that people can still be healthy, they can still have wellness, even as their body is dying. And again, that often isn't recognized in the Western culture. Um, we talk about technology, you know, when, when we're dealing with the, some of people that are still carrying around honey buckets, these are, these are kind of scary thoughts and um, documentation. We're working with often storytellers, and so we don't, we're giving them a handout sheet that has the written instructions, but we're not explaining why or what this is about, and it often just, it just, there's no meaning to it. Next slide. So how do we learn more? Um, there's, you know, we can do trainings like this one. Um, a lot of times engaging in community organizations, um, tribal affiliations, um, culture keepers, interpreters, or, or use them as cultural brokers, people that are integrated in a more um, rural lifestyle that can kind of translate some of the struggles or some kind of um, raise awareness to so that we can do better and we can teach better. Um, HRSA actually has a really nice website that talks about um, culture with the language and the health literacy. Um, they really break it down by race, race and ethnicity, general, gender, special populations, and age. I found it was, it was kind of interesting. It's a little bit basic, but I think in some cases it's really important to look at those basics. Next slide. I think awareness is really, if we're talking about cultural humility, awareness is really, really the key. Um, we have to be aware. Does talking about things, do the, does our population feel that it's going to cause that to occur? Um, we need to ask permission. Um, health customs, the family members, who is part of that, um, that decision making within that family? Um, customs. Different roles of men and women um, can really make decisions about who is getting health care, who can continue with the health care, and who is able to accept health care. And that is definitely, um, in other cultures, that's, that's a real thing. Um, religious beliefs, we've seen this a lot of times in healthcare care that um, religious beliefs will kind of um, supersede even life-saving interventions um, just because it is what it is. Dietary customs, again, Gracie can tell us all about that, but um, it's super important to integrate what's realistic and their food into um, a plan for weight loss or um, health maintenance because if you don't, they're not going to follow it. Um, and using kind of some knowledge, asking them about eye contact and physical touch. Some, in some cultures, it's expected, and some it's, it's really offensive. And so it's important to, if, if we don't know, to ask and stay curious. Next slide. So these are some practical questions that you can ask. Is there anything I should know about your culture, beliefs, or religious practices that would help me take better care of you? I think that's an awesome question. Um, it kind of opens it up for a broad discuss discussion and sets us kind of in the position of learning. And I think when we're inter interacting and engaging with our um, 
patients and our and our um, people that we're we're serving, we need to put ourselves in the position of learning and the position of pulling them out to us to help us understand how best we can care for them. I thought this was a really good question too. What do you call your illness and what do you think caused it? And again, this question might lead to, you might understand a little bit, not only the context of the question, but the way that it's answered. Maybe you'll, you'll clue in on you know, how they're coping, um, magical thinking, um, their, their ability to um, kind of integrate their disease process within their lifestyle, and maybe even touch up on um, uh, like uh, traditional healers or, or other things that they've been using um, to help with their health. Um, this is another question or another way to phrase it. Your condition is very serious. Some people like to know everything that is going on with their illness, while others may want to know what is important, but maybe not all the details. How much do you want to know? Is there anyone else that you'd like me to talk about or that you'd like me to talk to about your illness? I think palliative care, this is one of the foundations that we kind of hang on to um, with when we're just kind of interviewing and engaging with our families. It's absolutely a gift and a privilege to be part of these families for such a short time when there's so much at stake and um, often really emotional and really um, stressful. And so really talking about um, asking permission, um, engaging people that are important, reminding them um, that, that it's not just about um, us, that it's about them and their family and how they're interacting in their family and how their disease or the condition is affecting the way that they're seeing themselves in that family. And it's also really important, we touched on it a second ago, to ask about traditional healers. Um, a lot of our people here in the Native Hospital are using a lot of um, kind of curious ways to get better. Um, some people do chaga, some people drink the urine of their grandson. These are all really important things that we should probably know of, and anything that we ingest could potentially um, disturb electrolytes or even, um, you know, speed up or slow down metabolism that can lead to um, significant side effects or um, having uh, medications that don't work as well just by the way that the metabolism is clearing those things. Next. So this was a wonderful little tidbit that I came up with when reading an article. Um, we talked about, when you look at the words care versus caring, they're very similar. It's hard to, it's hard to um, kind of delineate which, when, which one is different and how they're different. But when you add the word health, it becomes very interesting. Um, when we think about health care, it becomes very evidence-based. We try to be equitable. It provides for the medical needs of the patient specific to the diagnosis and treatment. That is health care in its fundamental state. When we open it up to the broader idea of health caring, that seems a little bit more um, exciting to me, that we're mindful, we're still caring, we're still using the healthcare system, but we're caring and we're mindful that patients are people with feelings who matter. We, we engage them as people and who they are in their time and space, that we consider that feeling, that inherent feeling of vulnerability, dependency, or loss of control. We see this when patients are really angry or family members are really angry. We, we can assume and we shouldn't, but we, um, we should investigate whether or not that anger is coming from fear. Um, and a lot of times it is. So when we ask ourselves, you know, how might this news make a person feel? Or how would it feel when I'm waiting um, for somebody to show up to me to, to take me in for a test or a treatment? All of these things can create a significant amount of stress. Next slide. So... Just to wrap it up, um, some final words about culture. We, we tend to, frankly, use it a lot of times as an excuse. Um, I've, I can't tell you how many times that I've heard providers talk about um, it's not culturally sensitive to talk about this, or I didn't talk to about this because they didn't want to talk about it, um, and they use it as a crutch. I think that it's important that we, again, stay curious and um, ask these questions. 
that we um, investigate so that culture isn't a barrier and it helps us to make a more meaningful um, connection. Next slide. Quote, stay curious, keep learning, and keep growing, and always strive to be more interesting than interesting. I find that a really poignant quote. Um, and so that's pretty much it for my little spiel. I feel like I haven't said anything, but hopefully <laughs> it was a little bit helpful. That was great, Rana. Well, um, we want to go ahead and open it up to the group. Um, there's uh, quite a few people on, so I was just going to let you know that um, for those who um, you can use, a, there's like a text area, so you can do a chat box to let us know if you have a question, so that's one way. You can wave your arms and, um, and we can call on you. And uh, so if you could just say your name and what question you have, or it might even be a comment uh, about culture. So I'm going to open it up. We're checking the chat box too. I know, I'm getting on <laughs> I'm like, I'm great. I, like, I have a question, and um, I was just wondering, within Alaska, because, you know, <laughs> there, what is it, 255 separate tribal, um, or just villages in general, um, and so, and I know we group regionally, those areas like Yupik, Hadathaskin, and so I just wonder how like those terms really define culture um, within Alaska, or is that kind of a westernized way to clump people together? I, I mean, I think that that's something that can be argued or something that's individual, um, just beliefs or, or um, thoughts or experiences. I feel like in some ways, you know, grouping a culture can be helpful just to get a great, a, an idea of maybe some of those things that, um, you know, are important, like where they live. Maybe we can talk about, you know, their access to health care. Maybe if we know that that's more of a um, traditional area, maybe language is an issue and we can kind of dig a little deeper than that. But oftentimes we'll see, um, you know, somebody coming in from Kotzebue, and we, we assume that they're traditional Yupik, but they grew up in New York City. Um, so, I, again, I think culture can be one way or another. Um, it can always step you up. So it's important, again, to really pull back and, and think about that story and try to learn a little bit more about what is it from their culture, ethnicity, and their race that has contributed to the person that they are and how are their experiences um, shaping them or um, worrying them as we move forward in our in, in health. And I think that could be really a good step for not only building rapport, but taking the best possible care of our patients. Is that a Miss America answer? It's all <laughs> Is that Lima over there? We'll go to the, yeah, AMT, oh, okay. <laughs> I think um, I would just add to that, too, in that a lot of times I'll ask people where they're from, not to classify them, but to connect with them. Mm -hmm. And um, that's really important. I think, too, when I think of, you know, we have over 200 tribes in Alaska, and to try to learn, learn every nuance of every culture of every language is not realistic, but what I really try to help people understand in our role is that uh, respect and dignity are cross-cultural wherever you go. Even if you fumble with a, you know, not something, a cultural concept that's really important to them, if you just are respectful and humble and apologize and say, oh, that wasn't my intent and communicate well, then it really isn't that big of a deal. <laughs> um, I think a lot of times, people get so anxious about being culturally appropriate that um, we make it worse <laughs> with our anxiety when really if you're just humble and kind and respectful, the work is done. I see. Thank you for bringing that up, Lina. And I, I see that a lot of times, even with um, providers who maybe have a different accent, it's really, really hard for patients to understand. 
a lot of times bells really, really um, connect with a provider, even with a crazy accent or a crazy different background, just because they're taking time, just because they treat them um, more kind of gently or they're more curious. So thank you for bringing that up. Great. Any other questions or thoughts or comments? And from our group, any questions or comments or thoughts? Uh, there is something in the chat. Oh, great. It says, why was Wi-Fi included in the pyramid that was shared? Because that shapes who we are. Screen time. <laughs> <laughs> Affects depression and anxiety. Look at it. Um, no, it was supposed to be funny. Sometimes I fail at that. But no, I was just trying to be spicy. <laughs> spicy run. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Well, great. Well, thank you. Oh, and there's an okay. <laughs> oh, <Nope>, so <laughs> perfect. Well, awesome. Well, we're going to go ahead and move on to introductions 